The title of this morning's sermon is, Let Not Your Hearts Be Troubled. Let Not Your Hearts Be Troubled. We're going through the book of John, and here we are in this important moment where Jesus' time on the earth is up. He is going to the cross. He is preparing to die for our sins, to save us from sin and from death. But Jesus loves his disciples. He continues to teach them. And so here we are in John 14. But as he's doing this, the disciples are troubled. They're worried. They're afraid. They're, they're not sure of what's going on. They're doubtful, perhaps even feeling hopeless, feeling in despair with this feeling of darkness over them. Why is that? Well, if you remember the last few weeks, Jesus told them earlier in the text, he said, where I am going, you cannot follow. Where I'm going, you cannot follow. Jesus was going to the cross. He was going to die and rise again from the dead and ascend. And his disciples could not go with him because they're not the Savior. He is. He has to go alone. Remember, Chronicles of Narnia, Aslan says to the two girls in the forest, stop right here. You cannot follow me from now on. Where I have things to do. So they're troubled by that because they've been with Jesus for years, for three years. And now Jesus is saying, I'm leaving you. I'm departing. You cannot follow me. So they're troubled by this, obviously. But more than that, they're troubled because Jesus goes on to say that one of them is going to betray him. And we know that's Judas. And on top of that, Peter, he opens his mouth and says, No. I will die for you. And Jesus says, no, Peter, actually, you're going to betray me too. You're going to deny me three times before this day is over. And so can you imagine Peter is troubled? The disciples, they're scared. What is going on? Is this the end? This is not a good moment. And the simple questions are this. Will Jesus abandon us? Is everything worth nothing? All the stuff we did for three years... Is it all thrown away? Jesus, what is going to happen to us? Is Jesus even real? Is any of this real? Did I just waste and ruin my life? If you can sympathize, if you can understand these questions and what the disciples were going through in this text, then that will be good for you. We go through troubles too, do we not? Perhaps today, this week, this month, this year, your hearts have been very much troubled. Maybe you've been going through some deep spiritual struggles in your Christian life. Maybe you've had this ongoing relationship problem that you cannot solve. Maybe there's stuff at work or at school, and maybe you're making a big decision in your life. What is troubling you today? Well, praise be to God, because listen to what Jesus says. He says, let not your hearts be troubled. The title of the sermon. I want to share with you four encouragements that Jesus says to back up this statement. Let not your hearts be troubled. Why not? Number one, first, dear church, be encouraged because the Son and the Father are one. The Son and the Father are one. In verses 1, Jesus says, believe in God, believe also in me. He's making a connection between him and the Father. And in verses 8 to 10, he's responding to Philip. He says, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. And here's the encouragement, and I'll explain it. He's saying, guys, the Father and I were one. Within the Trinity, there is a relationship between the Father and the Son, and while it's not mentioned, he's not mentioned, the Holy Spirit too. And this relationship between all persons of the one triune God, but here in particular, the Father and the Son, it's a perfect relationship. It's unchanging. It's abounding in glory and power and love. This is basic theology. But do you realize how foundational this is to us? I'll prove it to you with an illustration, with an, an analogy. It's not perfect, but you're smart. You don't need to be a psychologist to understand this. But when you think about children, 
kids growing up and seeing their parents, their moms, their dads, and if they see their parents fight, if they see that there's conflict or lack of love in the marriage, if they see their mom and dad get divorced, or just even the danger, the possibility of getting divorced, you, you know what that does to the children. It affects them. They worry. They're afraid. They're not certain of their family. There is perhaps a feeling of hopelessness and despair. There is an utter darkness that can come over a child who sees their mom and dad separate. Their hearts are troubled and they will ask, will mom and dad abandon us? Is everything worth nothing now in our family? What's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to my little brother or little sister? Maybe these kids will grow up and maybe they'll just accept the fact that love is not real. Maybe they'll think that their lives are ruined. On the other hand, if children see that their parents are doing well, that there is love, that there is an unshakable bond, that there is unity between husband and wife, that affects the kids in a good way for reasons that don't need to be explained. They are comforted. They feel safe. They feel secure. They have a home. If you understand that, then do you see what Jesus is saying here? Believe in God. Believe also in me. I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Dear church, you will never be abandoned by God. You know why? Because in the Godhead, within the three persons of our triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, there is no abandonment. The Father cannot abandon the Son. The Son will never abandon the Father. Dear church, you realize that you will never be alone because it is impossible for the Father, Son, and Spirit to be separated and alone. So, dear church, do not be troubled in heart. Here's a wonderful case where theology matters a lot. Are you worried? Are you doubtful? Do you feel hopeless? Is there darkness overcoming you? Then meditate on the reality that Jesus says here, that the Son and the Father are one, and therefore, if that's true, the Son and the church you and Jesus are one as well. The second encouragement that Jesus says is found in verses 2 to 4. Jesus encourages us by reminding us, by telling us that we have an eternal home that is being made ready and that is going to wait for us. He says, In my Father's house are many rooms. I go to prepare a place for you. I will come again and take you to myself. Where I am, you may be also. Jesus says, I'm going to take you to a new home. Now, don't take this literally. A lot of Christians do this and they say, whoa, a lot of rooms, that's a mansion. We're going to live in a mansion. Uh, that's not technically possible because there's so many Christians. I mean, what kind of house is this? So this is metaphorical, but it's also literal. What Jesus is talking about is literally a new heavens and a new earth a physical realm, the kingdom of God that is coming, a new earth that we're going to live in. That's our house. That's the home, the many rooms. We're going to fill this earth in the new heavens and the new earth. Now, we don't know exactly how that's going to work, what that's going to look like. For example, is it going to be the same exact planet, the same map with USA and, you know, all the states still, like, you know, mapped out? Or is it going to be a completely new planet with different continents? I don't know. But I do know this. It will be just as real as this planet. A lot of Christians, we think that when the eternal life starts, we're just floating wisps of spirits in heaven. We talk about, yeah, we're going to be forever with God in heaven. Technically, that's not true. The Bible tells us a new heavens and a new earth. And God's people, you're going to be there. 
that place Jesus is preparing, is making ready for you to live in. And it's real. It's just as real as Jesus' own resurrection body, of which we eat the bread and the cup every Lord's Supper. It's real. Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. That's not mere poetry. Jesus, too, he's literally somewhere right now. He has a real body. So will we in eternity, in the kingdom, in that place called home. And so can I ask you this fun little application? Let's say it's the same exact earth. Where do you want to live in this new kingdom? New York City? Actually, it'll be called New New York City, probably, because new heavens and new earth. Maybe you'll decide, I want to live in a quiet little village in Japan. Good for you. Or you want to try your your lot at the wilderness in Kenya. You want to live there. Or maybe you just want to stay where you are now, in your little room. (laughs) That's fine. But actually, I just tricked you. That was a trick question. You know why? This new heavens and new earth is eternal. So for the rest of eternity we will be able to explore this entire new heavens and new earth. And I bet you you're going to live everywhere. (laughs) Maybe a few dozens of years here, maybe another century there. This is mind-blowing. But this place is going to be so awesome. It's going to be so infinite that it will take us eternity to enjoy it, to live in it, a place a home without sin without death and so for all you who love to travel and you you think this world is beautiful wait till you see the new heavens and a new earth the eternal home that jesus is preparing and by the way do you notice he says i go to prepare a place for you what is jesus is he building something is he vacuuming what does it mean to prepare we don't know for sure but it does mean this this active action, this fact that God has to prepare this means this is probably going to be awesome. The fact that God is preparing this is mind-blowing. He doesn't just snap a finger as if it's effortless. He's working. He's preparing. He's getting this place ready for you, for us. And then on top of that, he's not telling us, okay, I'll see you there. Meet me here. Don't be late. No, he's going to actually come back, get you, and take you to be with himself. He's going to escort you personally to the new heavens and the new earth on that day when he comes back. That is first-class service. That is who our Jesus is. He's going to personally take us home. And so, dear church, this is his second encouragement Do you believe what I'm saying? Or do you think this is all a myth, that this is metaphor? Because it's not. There is literally a new heavens and a new earth being made ready for you. And so be encouraged that this place, whether it's awesome or it's terrible, and basically, honestly, it's kind of (laughs) terrible if you really stop and think about it. Our homes might be nice, But guess what? The ultimate home, it's going to blow this out of the water. The home that is coming is better than mansion, better than what Christians think it's going to be. It's going to be so awesome. Is that not encouraging to us? That this is not our home? That no matter how hard we try and build things, or no matter what happens to us, if we lose things, I don't know about you, but I don't think I'll ever own a home I don't think I want to. It's too much work. And if I'm going to be a pastor, just, I just can't think about it. I'll, I'll end up with just a condo. But I can read all those magazines of houses and homes and cottages and, oh, I want this kind of style home. I've learned to let go and really believe that, you know what? God has an even better home waiting for me, and I can't wait to go there. Seriously, dear church. Let that be an encouragement to us today. Will Jesus abandon us? No. He's coming back and he's going to take us home. 
So dear church, do not be troubled in heart. The third encouragement that Jesus says is this, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. He says this in verses five to seven, very famous text, but I wanna tell you this about this famous saying. When Jesus says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life, what he's saying there is, dear sinner, your salvation is me. What makes Christianity like nothing else is that salvation will come through a person. All the other religions out there, they will say, if you want to be saved, you got to do this. Every other religion says there's a way that you have to live. So go that way. There's a truth for you to believe. Live out that truth. But Jesus says, no. The way you're going to be saved is me. It's personal. I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. Jesus is not saying, hey, this is the way, which is what the Mandalorian says. This is the way. Jesus doesn't point to this thing and says, hey, look, that's the truth. Believe it. He doesn't say, go to that life. Good luck. No, Jesus says, I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. And this is such an encouragement to us today. Because there may become times in your life, it happened to me too, where we may think, as crazy as this sounds, we may may wonder as our enemy attacks us in our hearts and minds, and we may think that Christianity is not real, that it's fake, that it's all made up, it's just another religion like the rest of them. We may doubt our salvation at times. We may not be sure if God is even real and we may be overcome by utter darkness. We may not know anymore what is true and what is not true. Can I trust the Bible? Is all of this real? And when we face death, we may be scared. Is everything I learned since Sunday school real? Did I just waste my life on Christianity? Dear church, If those thoughts ever came to you before or if they do come later in your life, do not be afraid. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Why? Because God says, Jesus says, it's me. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I am God. I am the son of God. God does not lie. I am not a liar. I am the good shepherd. I have given you my body and my blood. I lived, I died, and I rose again. And guess what? It's all written down in the Bible, the most historic book ever. And guess what? So many people in history, in time and space, saw Jesus live. They saw Jesus die, and they saw Jesus rise again from the dead. which means that Jesus is real. When all is stripped away, when you are left with nothing left to cling to but Jesus, he's enough. The fact that he is real, that God is real, that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary, that Jesus came into this world and became fully human and lived and died and rose again, This is comforting. When all else fails, when we can find no other comfort, when we are left alone, when we are in the darkness, when we are feeling hopeless and worried and scared, we don't know what is true. Praise be to God that Jesus is the way, that Jesus is the truth, that Jesus is the life. And so we cling to him That is our encouragement today. Fourth and finally, let us be encouraged because the time that we live in right now, it's the best time ever up to now. In verses 12 to 14, Jesus says these words, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do and greater works than these he will do. 
this is weird. Is Jesus saying, hey, Christians, you're going to do things that are better than what I did? Yes and no. No, we're not going to do things better than him. Like, we're not going to go to the cross better than him or save people from sins better than him. That is not what Jesus is talking about. Here's what he's talking about. When he says that when I leave, when I send you, disciples, you, the church, you're going to do greater things than what I did, he's saying this. He's saying, after I die and rise again, the Holy Spirit will come and usher in a new age. The old age is fading away. The new age is beginning. And when I rise from the dead, there is now an overlap in time and space in history. Redemptive history is coming to an end, and the church will now explode. And we see this in Acts. We see this in the history of Korea and Asia. We're seeing it right now. It doesn't feel like an explosion. What Jesus is saying is that after he dies and rises again, the church will win like crazy through suffering, but unto glory. The church will evangelize in ways like never before. To the ends of the earth, Jesus will be glorified. And all that work of the church, that's what Jesus is saying. You're going to do things better and greater than what I did in the three years on my time on earth. And that's crazy. Isn't that encouraging? So you thought the feeding of the 5,000 was amazing? You're right, it was. But you know what's more amazing? How about millions and millions, maybe billions, I don't know, of sinners repenting and believing in Jesus? The feeding of God's kingdom. That feeding of 5,000, tiny, compared to the great, greater works that we are part of today. You thought that the resurrection of Lazarus was amazing? That was a resurrection with a lowercase r. He died again. But how about this? This is what's better. How about a mom or a dad telling their child in the quiet of the living room, telling them about Jesus, and the, G and the child says, yeah, I believe in what you're saying. I believe in Jesus. And there begins a new life, a new resurrection life in a little child born-again Christian, that resurrection life is the greater works that the church is doing today. You thought the journeys of Jesus were amazing? He did a lot of stuff in his three years on earth. But how about the journeys of Paul? How about the journeys of all the missionaries that started churches in Asia and throughout the ends of the earth, and now some of them ended up building this church some of them taught your parents who ended up bringing you to church. Now you're here at this church, and now you're having kids, and wow. How about this journey here at Highland and to the ends of the earth? That's what Jesus is talking about. Greater works will come, greater than what I did. So it's true. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> these are the final days, and these are the best of days. Obviously, when Jesus comes back, that will be even better. But the time and the space that we're living in now, the final days before Jesus comes back, this is a wonderful time. We are doing greater works than Jesus. And whatever we ask in Jesus' name for the sake of his kingdom, Jesus will do it. Highland, is that not encouraging? Do not be troubled in heart. We won. We are doing greater things now. Everything is worth everything now. So do not be afraid. Do not doubt. Do not despair. Let not your hearts be troubled because the Son and the Father are one, because Jesus is preparing an eternal home for us, because he's the way, the truth, and the life we are living in the best times. Let's pray. As our praise team comes up, uh, let me pray for us. Father, we thank you so much 
for your word. Thank you so much, Jesus, for your words of encouragement. Please help our hearts to not be troubled. Help us to not be troubled in our hearts and in our minds. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray.